how much are you willing to go up to to re-sign John Collins? Again, I mean, you and I have had this discussion, I think, 10 times by now. Yeah. I am just not sold on a guy who needs to be set up um, by others almost exclusively. Let's start with Atlanta since this is so fresh in our memory. They, you know, had an incredible run in these playoffs. Um, I I mean, people were picking against them in that the Knicks series, which I still don't understand. Like no one expected them to make it to the Eastern Conference Finals. And the good thing for them is that most of their their team is under contract for next season. Like things will get tough eventually and we'll get to that shortly. But, you know, you're running back. Gallinari, Bogdanovich, Clint Capella, Trey Young, DeAndre Hunter, Onyeko Okongwu, who had some great games in the playoffs, yeah. Cam Reddish, Kevin Herter, all under contract for 21-22 already. So No Bruno alone, Fernando? Really? Bruno, how could I forget Bruno Fernando? I'm sorry, Bruno. Uh, <laughs> that alone is a great rotation. The big question, of course, is John Collins, who is a restricted free agent this summer. Probably, I mean, he turned down a extension worth about $90 million heading yeah. into the year. I think that was from Chris Kirshner and Sam Amick of The Athletic. Probably ended up being a good decision based on, you know, kind of the season they had and how he played in the playoffs. If you're the Hawks, how much are you willing to go up to to re-sign John Collins? Again, I mean, you and I have had this discussion I think 10 times by now. Yeah. I am just not sold on a guy who needs to be set up um, by others almost exclusively. I mean, look, 77.5% of Collins' made field goals this year were assisted. So he's not someone who can self-create. Let's say Trey Young goes down with an injury. Knock on wood, that doesn't happen. Like, who's there to create for John Collins? You can't give him the ball at, like, the elbow and say, hey, go create. He's not that kind of player. Well, I mean, you you can, but it's just not going to be a super efficient form of offense. Correct. Correct. It's not going to be what you want it to be, right? Right. So it's one thing if he was one of those guys who, like, uh, like, like, Phoenix Amari Stoudemire, you know what I mean? Where it was like 26 per game, 20, 20 points uh, or 26 points per game, 10 plus rebounds, like the pick and roll uh, offense that just completely devastates everything. And and to be fair, he has some of that in him. But like, I, I, I would want to see more before I was like, okay, I need to max this guy. I would probably look at around 20 million as my, my max. When I go into like the stats and I look into contractual worth of other players as well, especially these multi-purpose wings, I just don't value John Collins to the same extent. I mean, he's almost exclusively a four. Like mm-hmm. we, we're we're in a league right now where positional fluidity is a term. Positionless basketball is a is is a frequent uh, discussion point. And here we have one guy who has to be pigeonholed into one position because he can't really play center, can't play the three, he's a four. And not having that positional uh, flexibility for someone who needs to receive, what, 30 plus minutes per game, I think that could limit you. So I'm not ready to break the bank for John Collins. And I would even feel a little bit rough with 20 million a year and i realized that not a lot of people share that belief that i have i know a lot of people are like more you know what there's still room in the nba for power fours all right great i completely disagree with you but that's fine <laughs> i don't think the, the traditional power forward has any any um any merit left in the nba i think that's dead and buried and i think it should be given that how there are far superior options out there i think there's a reason that it seems currently in the nba finals are multi-positional players like Jay Crowder used to be a three Giannis has literally played every single position on on the hardwood and while many would label him a four he's a basketball player who can play virtually one through five he is as positionless as they come and he has no weakness in terms of playmaking ball handling defense rebounding so it's I, I think this is where we're looking moving forward I think having 
players who are pigeonholed into one position is going to be a net negative for most teams. And I look at John Collins, despite the fact that I like John Collins very much, as being one of those guys. And you know, I talked up this guy when he got before he got drafted. I love him. I, yeah. I, 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 I do not dislike the player John Collins. I just think he, the archetype of player that he is is somewhat dead. And I think that should be reflected in price. If he signs for somewhere along the lines of 16, 18 million, then I could get behind it. But I don't think he will. I think it's going to be substantially more. Yeah, if he gets a max, I don't. I think Atlanta is going to match whatever he gets. Oh, I don't. They're, they're at least sending that signal. Yeah. According to just like, I think it was Windhorst and Von Temps were reporting that back in March. So I think they don't want to lose him for nothing. Right. I don't think they max, though. I don't think they match a max. I, maybe they try to negotiate a sign-in trade at that point. Yes. That they should do because they yeah. have their future. And I'm putting this in quotation marks for in DeAndre Hunter, who is right. that type of player. Um, right. And frankly, I would rather have DeAndre Hunter playing that spot. I would rather have, like, the, the Hawks have the potential to be one of the teams in the league with the most positional flexibility players. Yes. Like, outside of Trey Young. And you know what? It's fine if you have a one position player who's a ball handler and creator. Right. Like, that doesn't matter. You can build around him in every capacity you want. Um, but, like, Kevin Herter can play two positions, DeAndre Hunter can play two positions. On Yeka Okongwu, while probably more so a center than a four, can still play the four. Like, there's also some mush multiple position uh, thing in there. And Clint Capella, sure, he's a center through and through, but you know what? He's also paid to be just that. And the center position has died. As long as you can play defense, as long as you can dive to the rim as a center, you have value. And mm -hmm. he is also not grotesquely paid. He's actually on a very reasonable contract. Danilo Gallinari can play multiple positions. I mean, Cameron Reddish, in yeah. theory, can play three positions. Uh, we are, we're looking maybe even four because his ball handling projects as being really good. Mm -hmm. um, there's just so much to like with the Hawks in terms of their positional fluidity. But also maybe they make that argument that because we have so many multiple uh, positional players, we can afford to have one in John Collins who isn't. Maybe, maybe that's something they're discussing internally. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's as simple as you have Young at one, Capella at five, and then you can mix and match Bogdanovich, Herder, Reddish, and Hunter interchangeably almost yes, as your three right. wings slash forward slash whatever the hell you want to call them. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But you're you're totally right. I mean, they can go as positionless as they want. Um, and I, I, you know, I think the presence of Hunter should at least give them pause about matching a max. I, you know, I I think some team will probably throw that offer out there just because the free agent class is so depleted. I know the Spurs have come up repeatedly yes. as a potential Collins destination, and I actually do like that fit. You know, do do I think Atlanta would be smart to match a max and keep John Collins on that contract for the duration of it? No. But I also don't think you want to lose John Collins for nothing. So Agreed. I, ideally, I think you're right. If you can get him back at a lower price, I'm looking at Profit X that has you know projections for the next three years. So they're saying over the next three seasons, he's going to be worth about 68.5 million, which is you know probably about six seven million per year below what he would earn on a max deal. Right. If you can get him. Like, like, you know, next year's starting salary would be 22.9 million. That's even a little high for me, but fine. Like, if you can get him at that instead of, you know, 28, 29 million, then I'm more open to it because he is a type of guy who you might be able to flip for value later, too. So even if you're lukewarm on keeping him for the duration of that contract, given the way the rest of your salary shakes out, like, you know, they could match that contract and still be nowhere near the luxury tax next year and kind of punt that decision down the road to 2022, which is where things start to get very hairy for them financially. Yeah. I will say this. <clears throat> I don't think he had a great year in the regular season. I think 
do, there was so much roster turnover, people angling for minutes, angling for shots. You know, he went four uh, points down per game on a per game average, almost three rebounds down as well. And he saw a minutes decrease by four minutes. Like he saw less shot attempts. If let's say his baseline were what he did in his third year, which was 21 and a half points, 10 plus rebounds over a block and a half, 80 from the line, 40 from three, and almost, oh, actually over 58% from the field overall. Okay, let's say that was his baseline and he built upon that moving forward. Yes, then I would argue that that type of money you just brought up would make a lot of sense because then you would just be, then you would have basically an assassin who can go out and get you points and then it doesn't matter what position he plays. You just, you bring him into the game for one, for one reason, to put up numbers, whether that's points, rebounds, three pointers, doesn't matter, just efficiency and production. And then all the, like when the game slows down and it's in the late stages, that's when you sit his ass down. That's when you bring in DeAndre Hunter. That's when you go positionless instead. So you you more or less make him a three-quarter player. Yeah. I mean, he spoke repeatedly this year about how he had to sacrifice. You know, he put up 20 and 10 over the last two seasons right. because he was playing for a crappy team and he was willing to take a step back in terms of his touches and his shot attempts this year because they added so much talent in free agency. But then that also begs the question, like if you did, you know, he is taking this step back in terms of production, should you be paying him a max deal or anywhere near a max deal? Because you don't need him to right. produce in that role or, or to that extent. Like you you want him, I don't want to say a role player necessarily, but you know, like Trey Young is very clearly the focal point of your team. And then after that, you're kind of just divvying up touches between all of these other guys. Yep. Bogdanovich, Herder, Hunter. Bogdanovich. I forgot to bring up Bogdanovich. He can also play multiple positions. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, it's going to be... Uh, that's the trickiest decision the Hawks have by far this offseason. What to do with John Collins, how much to pay for him. The other... Uh, now they have to also, like... In context of the Collins decision, mm -hmm. they need to be looking ahead beyond 21-22 because I like there's a real argument to pay him to just match whatever and you can run this thing back. But then in 22, Trey Young, I mean, he and Kevin Herter become eligible for extensions this summer. Trey Young is so clearly getting a max that it's not even worth discussing. He's going to get the designated rookie language. So if he makes an all-NBA team, We'll get 30% of the cap. Yeah. But Herder, can, can I think I, is, Can I just interject and say that there seems to be some buzz on Twitter about how Trey Young shouldn't get a max, and I'm laughing my ass off of that. Are you serious? Yeah, I've seen that a little bit. What In what world? Like, I, even the if argument? the Hawks had hesitation after oh, this playoff, or like before the playoffs, this playoff run ended it. Well, the argument is even more laughable because oh you know how you know how I harpered on this? It's the lack of team fans. Yeah, right, right, right. Like, sometimes you just need to ignore <laughs> that part. I mean, we're talking about a 25, 10 guy. Well, nine and a half. <laughs> His numbers over the past two years have been ridiculous. No, I agree with you, of course. Yeah, I, I mean, just wanted to point that out. I, like, I think it could have been fair. Like, this, this playoff run, I think, was very instructive for Atlanta. Because if you didn't see Trey Young in the playoffs, over the first three years and you have to weigh whether to give a max deal i think you still do it without yeah. question but you might be a little nervous like how does it translate to the playoffs when you know you're more in a half court setting and teams really start to like pick on mismatches do teams just continually target him and maybe personnel wise the teams the hawks faced during the playoffs weren't suited very well to do that like maybe if if the Hawks play Brooklyn in round two, Kyrie Irving just roasts Trey Young alive for the entire series and the Hawks go home. And now all of a sudden you do have to worry about that. But I think he proved to be such an elite offensive option mm -hmm. that you just don't worry about his like, yeah, do you want him to be a better defender? Of course you do. But you're still giving this guy a max contract because he is the yeah. lifeblood of your offense. And he, you know, they, you, he proved despite his defensive deficiencies that he can get you very far in the playoffs. So 
I have no hesitation if I'm Atlanta giving him a max deal. Right. So many guys who are worse than Trey Young have gotten max deals. Like, this is... Beyond Luka, he's like the easiest no-brainer in the class, I think. Of course he is. Look, I mean, the Sixers have PTSD just by watching the free-for-all line at this point. <laughs> but Herder, I think, is the more interesting discussion. Because he's also eligible for the extension. And so if, you, if you're if you the Hawks and you max Trey Young, <laughs> you match a max for John Collins this offseason, you're like really close to luxury tax territory next year before you even factor in a herder extension. So that's what I mean when I say they have to take the long approach here as well. Right. Like 2022 is where things get really tricky for them if they want to keep all of these young guys together. So what do you think? I mean, A, if you're Atlanta, do you even give Herder an extension this offseason? Or what do you think a fair price point would be for him? I honestly consider package him for or with someone else for something bigger. I think the Hawks are in a great position to make a consolidation trade. I made that yes. point before yep. uh, because they just have that many different players. It's almost a shame that they didn't do that before with John Collins, I think, because you know, I, I just don't think it, it going into restricted free agency with guys who have an unset value. I think I don't think that's smart for teams. I think that's an issue because you you may have to overpay. So that means you're looking at a situation where right now you can't just trade John Collins. He would have to agree to a sign and trade. So that's out of the table. That means if you're going to trade Kevin Herter, you need to package him with what? Cam Reddish, uh, Onyego Kongbu, like DeAndre Hunter. But then th- that return has to be insane though. Mm-hmm. But I do think that just the sheer bodies that they have on this team, it would make sense if they went shopping this year and and that's not to say i don't like kevin herter i like kevin herter a lot i think he's got uh, the potential to be one of the better three-point shooters in this league um especially when the confidence level is high he seems to be a bit of a confidence player but that Mm -hmm. confidence also seems to rise up more and more so i like him overall but i'm not looking at him as a necessary building block i i he's expendable if push came to shove and if you can upgrade the roster around Trey Young, which is the point of everything, then you do it. And I realize, what do you need to put alongside Trey Young? You need shooting. What does Kevin Herter have? Shooting. Yes, that's great. But if you can make that a little bit more interesting, maybe the guy you get in return is a two-way player. Maybe the guy you can get in return also is a bit of a, a rebounder. Maybe you get someone who's near all-star level. You know, I don't know who that player is necessarily, but there, there are definitely situations out there in the NBA that you can go explore. Um, Mm -hmm. So we'll see what happens, but I would definitely be open to moving Kevin Herter and probably a couple of other pieces to see what I could get in the open market this year. Yeah, Or not in the open market, the trade market, of course. Yes. Right, yeah. So I just wrote a piece or I published it just minutes before we started recording, kind of looking at the long-term view for Atlanta, because I think it's really tough to keep this title window open beyond the 21-22 season, just given all of these competing factors and like how much are they willing to pay up. Because you, you know, in 22, even if you re-sign Collins, give Trey a max, give Herter an extension or re-sign him, you can make more space. You can waive Gallinari. He's only got $5 million guaranteed in the 22-23 season. So that's not, you know, not the end of the world there. But then Bogdanovich can come... He can decline his player option in 23. It's 18 million. Capella's a free agent in 23. So like they're they're in the stage of team building where they have so many guys on rookie contracts that it was easy for them to add talent like Gallinari, like Bogdanovich, like Capella. Uh, I know they got Capella by a trade, but you know signed Capella, uh, Bogdanovich right. and Gallinari. When these young guys get off these rookie contracts. Not only will they not have cap space, but they're going to go way into the luxury tax. So they have to, you know, they're going to start losing pieces here in the next, after the 21-22 season. Uh, But I I agree with you. I think a consolidation trade is probably (laughs) their best path out of just this financial boondoggle where they're, like, they're going to end up losing talent just because they can't afford to pay everyone. Yeah. So... You know, like Bradley Beal, I think will be a popular name mentioned if you can. I mean, like, you and trade. I have brought up Bradley Beal in connection with Atlanta before. Yeah, 
But I wonder if Kawhi leaves and the Clippers decide to rebuild and are looking to move off of Paul George. You could do like Herder, Reddish, and Gallinari and then a pick or two for Paul George. Yeah, I mean, that would be filthy, but at the same time, does Paul George fit the Trey Young timeline as well? Right. Uh, yeah, that's the other thing they're going to have to balance here. I mean, Bradley Beal is young enough. He's only 27, I want to say. Uh, is he only that? Is, I thought he was a bit older. I thought he I was know, He's be... been in the league forever, but I think he's actually surprisingly no, young. He's 28. Okay, 28. Oh, he just turned 20. Yeah. But uh, still, like, you're right. He's he's younger than, than you might expect. Like, he's still got a solid four years left of his prime. Right. Hmm. Like, yeah, that's that would be interesting to me. Are, are there anyone out there who's younger? Like, maybe someone who's just stepped into his rookie extension time, or maybe someone who's very close to being... Uh, <laughs> Like, oh, you're laughing already. Who are you thinking? Well, Ben Simmons is available. <laughs> well, someone who can shoot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that's a, uh, Brandon Ingram. But I don't think the Pelicans want to take that step back. No, I don't think so either. But that's an interesting name. Like, that is that is honestly interesting. Some Someone of that ilk. Like, someone mm-hmm. who isn't quite a superstar... But who is, you know, a, a, an all star here and there? Like he was an all star this year. He was last year. Someone who who can hit from outside, who's got size. That's that's not a bad name to bring out there. And I, I agree with you. I don't think the Pelicans do anything to move him right now. But someone of that ilk could definitely be be fun. What or about? If, yeah, I was go ahead. Gonna, if the Celtics decided to, you know, really like if if the Horford thing doesn't work out and they just really need to, like Marcus Smart's going to leave. They're, they're going to retool a bit around Tatum. What about Jalen Brown? No, I, I think I think Tatum and Brown are a package thing. I think yeah. though they, I, I wouldn't do it. Like I'm, I'm actually going to go as far as saying I do not think the Celtics should even in, involve Jalen Brown in a Dame thing. I, oh. yeah, no, I, I, I think those two guys are on the similar timeline, Tatum and Brown. I think it would be ridiculous to to separate those two, especially because they play two of the most cr- crucial positions that lead the one uh, crucial position, which is wing, and they're right. interchangeable. Like both of those two guys can cover three positions. So I'm just not interested in moving that around. And plus, Jalen Brown gets better every single year by a substantial margin. Um, so, uh, or, or amount. So I, I'm just not interested in doing that i mean yeah yes yeah, it's difficult like who is out there where you can really consolidate there is one name though siakam <laughs> yeah no no uh he's also up there well up there he's 27. he's 27 yeah but there is one name that i keep circling to but again it would also depend on the team having to basically say you know what screw it we're pivoting into something else Carl Anthony Towns. Ooh. A Trey Young, Carl Anthony Towns, like, roster, just starting with those two and building from there. That would be interesting. If Minnesota were open to pivoting into a full-on rebuild, I mean, you could send them so many fun things. And draft picks, of course. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that's fun. that's kind of where Atlanta is, like, Again, I don't, you don't have to make any of these moves or any of these decisions until the 22-23 season. So if you think like this wasn't a fluke and that you think you are going to be in that top tier of title contender next year, just run it back and punt these problems until later. But like these are on the horizon. Like this I my hope my piece today at Forbes is like this title window might not be as open as long as you would think for a team comprised of mostly 20 something guys mostly guys in their young 20s yeah it's it's just like you're gonna have to you know how they handle all of these individual decisions from here will determine whether atlanta has staying power beyond next season or whether this is more of a flash in the pan yeah i think if you have trey young it's not going to be a flash in the pan 
Yeah, I, I think they're going to be a clear playoff team for a while, for sure. But this this is like the deal for me, just a, a town's caliber deal. I think that's the play, right? Like where you really swing on a tremendous talent. Mm-hmm. And yeah, sure, to the point where you where you actually may come out of the deal afterwards going, ooh, <laughs> we gave up a lot. But at the same time, you would have two players who, at least on paper, conceptually would fit together so well. Yeah. The last question about Atlanta, Nate McMillan was the interim coach. Do you think there's any way he's not back next year? I mean, it, it's funny, right? Because you and I have been skeptical of Nate McMillan for a while because he's one of those guys who slows the game down a lot and, and really seems to be leaning more defense and offense. And when when he got the tag this time around, we were a little bit, Nate McMillan for Trey Young? How does that work out? It did. I still have no explanation for how he just decided to pivot, but he did. And and maybe this was a, a, a Nate McMillan you know, moment of self-realization, just him going, hey, you know what? I realize what I have in terms of weapons on the roster. And mm-hmm. if I play into that hand, I stand a better chance of making it far in the playoffs. And it certainly seemed like that was the case. So yeah, I'm thinking he's absolutely back. I would be shocked if he wasn't. I mean, look at the results. What possible argument could you have if you're the Atlanta Hawks not to return him? Yeah, and from everything I've read throughout this playoff run, it sounds like Nate's time with the Pacers caused him to do some self-reflection. He was talking there. I forget. There was an athletic article. I apologize in advance because I don't remember who wrote it. I would guess Chris Kirshner. We have a lot of colleagues, Brian. We can't help it. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, but it was about like the old, quote unquote, the old Nate and the new Nate. Whereas like the old Nate would have lost his mind with this certain situation. But the new Nate realizes like, I just have to relate to players in a different way. Mm. I was reading an article today on The Athletic about how um, Cam Reddish and Lloyd Pierce never really saw eye to eye. But then McMillan came in, formed a quick connection with Reddish. And, you know, Reddish gets hurt right away. doesn't play really at all. I think he played three regular season games under McMillan. But then you see he comes back in this Bucks series and look what he did in game six. I mean, yeah. you know, like he, he looks and McMillan was comparing him to Paul George. So I, you know, I brought up Paul George earlier as a potential trade target. Like the Hawks might not, even if they start losing some of this ancillary talent, if you keep Trey Young, Cam Reddish and DeAndre Hunter, together yeah. and they continue building like they have uh, building on their respective games like they have over these first two seasons like this hawks team is going to be better next year because they have a healthy reddish and a healthy hunter hunter like th- you know he didn't play a ton in the playoffs but he was really freaking good at the start of this season he was like one of the only bright spots for the hawks for the first 20 games of the season he's and their second get- best player yeah. yeah. So, like, you know, they have some incredible young talent. Like, w- when I'm saying, you know, they have to be mindful of the long term future, like, this is just kind of the challenge of roster building. And I think it's, a, a, you know, a fun problem for, well, maybe not fun for him, but like a fun thought process for the rest of us. Travis Schlenk probably doesn't l- love his job after this year. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, they have just so much good young talent that for the next year or two if they continue on this trajectory like i i don't see any reason the hawks couldn't be back in this situation like would i pick them over a fully healthy brooklyn or milwaukee team right now going into next year maybe not but we also don't know like we talked about brooklyn already how their supported cast if they can keep bruce brown blake griffin jeff green if not do right. they downgrade because the Hawks supporting cast is going to stay strong. Like they're going to still be one of the deepest teams in the NBA next year. Yeah. And they have so many young guys who have already shown promising flashes on big stages. Like freaking Ogonku was a monster throughout some of these playoff games. Yeah. He showed a I'm, ton of promise. So I'm, I'm, I'm extremely bullish on the Hawks moving forward in the short term. And I am just, so fascinated with how they juggle all of these competing priorities beyond next season. 
I would not be shocked if by the end of next season, with one year left on his contract, Clint Capella is traded. Because at that point in time, Onyeko Kongvu has just proven to be the superior option because he's he's got more offensive game and you know obviously he's not as great of a rebounder or a shot blocker but i think overall he projects as a very very capable two-way guy at that point in time trey young is also a year older deandre hunter would be in his third year cam reddish would be in his third year maybe that's the play and then if you get something good for collins in the sign and trade scenario this summer I mean, good lord, maybe you just swing on the upside of the youth and then you pay. Maybe that's the play. You just say, you know what? All right, we have these. We, we understand now that Onyeko Kongbu, uh, Cam Reddish, Deandre Hunter, and Trey Young is our future, are, are our future. Mm-hmm. So let's just run with them and then we'll let Danilo Gallinari expire. We're, we're going to let Bogdan Bogdanovich, you know, test out the market when, when he's a free agent or whatever maybe they just play it out so they're competitive in the meantime and by 2023 Galinari, Bogdanovich and Capello simply aren't on the roster anymore yeah I mean it's a lot of talent to lose for nothing but it's certainly you could also trade them of course but I'm just saying like maybe yeah but but the thing is if you trade them you probably have to match salary like who, who would take on a Danilo Galinari 20 plus 20 20.4 million in cat raw cap space for right. this year for example i don't think anyone does that and that ups to well it's only a partial guarantee for 2022 2023 but i, I don't know you can probably get off a of book though you can definitely get someone oh, to yeah. absorb his his 18 million absolutely and probably get them back a pick or something yeah um, i mean that's the the problem is like if you're trading these guys for players rather than picks you're still bringing salary back like at some point this roster is just going to become prohibitively expensive yes so and and that's why i keep going back to the consolidation trade yeah right i think that is the play and like the good thing for the hawks is that having gallinari bogdanovich capella they have some of those like mid mid mid-tier salary matching chips where it's not like you know you're not going to get russell westbrook on a 40 million dollar contract but you also don't want russell westbrook on a 40 million dollar contract you've got some of those guys who you can and like that could be another reason to re-sign uh, John Collins as well, which could just be another one of those, you know, especially if he's not on a max deal, another one of those like 20-ish million salary matching contracts to attach some of these young guys to to bring in a Bradley Beal or someone else. Or he could be the main cog in a return for Carl Anthony Towns because the Wolves like John Collins. There you go. Yeah, the Hawks are, I'm just so interested to see where they go from here. Because it like, the future looks astoundingly bright right now. (laughs) But if there's ever been, I mean, look back to OKC a couple years ago. Like, the challenge becomes when you have to start paying all of these extremely talented young players. And like, we thought OKC was going to be a dynasty. And then, you know, we, we know what happened. So... Atlanta had an incredible run. I think they will be even better next year. What they look like in 2022 and beyond just endlessly fascinates me. Agreed.